Why would I care about Hasselblad's new 45mm f4 lens? Why would you? Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone with Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I want to tell you how a new lens from Hasselblad has profoundly changed my outlook on their X1D2 medium format mirrorless camera. But before I do, a brief word and update on our Streets of New York street photography workshops. Here. I want to share with you, as I will do often in the coming days and weeks, that registration is now open for our 2020 Streets of New York street photography workshops, and I am stoked. Now, those of you who know me or have attended or have read some of the testimonials know why. These are life-affirming experience for attendees and for Claudia and I. Not that I'm biased or anything. It's a different kind of workshop, I think. A wonderful mix of technique, sure. Shooting and review, of course, lots of it. But also history, philosophy, ethics, and private tours, not only of a couple of extraordinary photographic institutions, but the opportunity to visit iconic locations inhabited or shot by legendary photographers. It is also a lovely opportunity, though I really shouldn't say it quite like that because it's actually central to the experience to spend time with a small, intimate group of like-minded people in the greatest place on earth in my book for the genre. Maybe rekindle your joy for the medium, perhaps even hone your artistic voice and ambitions. Incredible people, accomplished people, a diverse group of people, just plain nice people making it even more special. And with thanks once again to our friends at Hasselblad, we'll be holding our class sessions at their beautiful New York Experience studio in NoHo, perfectly located. Space is limited. The number of folks have already signed up. Thank you. Claudia and I are looking forward to meeting you. So if you're interested or want to learn more, please visit www.3bmep. Click on the link for workshops right there on the top menu or on the little hamburger all the way to the right. Or you can just find the link down below in the show notes. Back to the new Hassi XCD 45mm f4 P for portable on the X1D2. It's an autofocusing wide standard lens, the full frame equivalent field of view, depth of field of call it a 35 2.8, though f4 remains f4 from an exposure perspective, and the depth of field wide open is more like that of a 35mm set to f3.3, actually. But let's not quibble. The larger point is that this is not exactly esoteric, is it? Still, the 45-4P is a tiny, lovely piece of glass capable of shallower depth of field than you might think, marred only by a very, very slight bit of spherochromatic aberration I only noticed once. More importantly, at an unheard of 1100 bucks for Hasselblad anyway, this lens, when coupled to the X1D2 for which it was designed, lowers the entry point into the legendary world of Swedish medium format cameras to become... Suddenly, when you think about it, and embrace it for what it actually does best outside of the studio. Use it as it actually works best outside of the studio, which is to say, auto-focus off, auto-exposure off, a kick medium format EVF only Leica M alternative with a different yet no less breathtaking look at a bargain price. A fast, unobtrusive, joyous, magnificent street camera. Easier to focus for me anyway than an M with the Type 20 EVF. Who'd have thunk it? Like this.
Yeah, let's get into it. Why do I see the X1D2 with 45 F4P combo this way? Well, A. On the one hand, it offers stunning image quality, like the Leica. Wonderful industrial design, user interface, build, handling, and heritage, like the Leica. Compact size and weight, like the Leica. Excellent EVF and the surprisingly nice dedicated iPad only focus to mobile app. But on the other hand, B, straight up, the X1D2 suffers from middling secondary controls once untethered from a tripod. Maddeningly slow autofocus, long EVF blackout. But reduce shutter lag and blackout by turning off autofocus and auto exposure, going back to basics like setting the exposure triangle manually, and it's a different camera. It doesn't have video. There's no IBIS. There's no articulating screen, just like an M. The Hassie is expensive, 5700 bucks body only, and yet to some, it is a bargain. At 6800 bucks with the 45 4P, we're talking about half the price of the original X1D's 2016 launch of 11700 including the comparable lens available for it at the time, the $2,700 XCD 45 3.5, still available now. Almost one-third the price of Hassi's modular medium format DSLR H6050C with HC53.5 f2, or the black and white only 40 megapixel full frame Leica M10 monochrome with Apo Sumicron M50, and a quarter of the price of the H6D100C body only. Yeah, right. I can just imagine some of us thinking about now repurposing John Lennon's famous request of the royalty and exceptionally well-heeled present during the Beatles' 1963 Royal Variety performance, if you wouldn't mind, just rattle your jewelry. I get it. Fair enough. This is a niche product with a niche segment most of us will never be able to afford. And it has to be said, depending upon who you are and what you do, you can get amazing images from an iPhone, a Use 1967 FTQL with 51.8, like this one actually, for 100 bucks, give or take. A 17 megapixel Micro Four Thirds Panasonic Lumix LX100 II for 900 bucks with built in 24 to 74, 35 to 56 field of view, depth of field, full frame equivalent. A 24 megapixel APS C Nikon Z50 with its kit lens for 1000 bucks. I mean, I could do this all day long, but you get the idea. Now, you could argue that there's another more relevant set of competitors out there. I agree with you wholeheartedly. At the low end of the high end, hey, it's all relative. That's part of the point. Say the 42 megapixel full frame Sony RX1R2 with integrated non interchangeable 35 millimeter F2 for 3300 bucks. More obviously and directly, the 50 megapixel medium format Fujifilm GFX 50R with 50 millimeter 3.5 for four grand, or the 50S with the same lens for about six grand, or the GFX 100 with same lens for about 10.5. At which point you do have phase detect autofocus, IBIS, 102 megapixels, you know the drill. Then again, you can get IBIS and just about 50 megapixels from any number of full-frame cameras these days with smaller lenses, if not always less expensive, like the Sony a7R 3 Nikon Z7, Panasonic S1R, Leica SL2, even 61 megapixels and killer, just killer autofocus from the Sony a7R 4 $3,500 body only. The questions become whatever your station in life. First, what are the downstream costs as you build out any of these systems with additional glass? Can you really afford or justify that expense? How much weight can you tolerate? And then, second, but most importantly in my book, where's your joy? 
Look, here are three blind men and an elephant. We use and will likely continue to use micro four-thirds cameras, the Panasonic GH5, which is what I'm using right now, and G9, sometimes the APS-C uh, A6400 uh, for our video work. They're actually better for what we do than larger, heavier, more expensive, less complete full-frame cameras. The GFX100 is an extraordinary engineering feat, but it's simply too big and far beyond what we need for our professional or personal work. The GFX50S is also too big for what we do, while missing the IBIS that I now prefer to have on all our cameras. The GFX50R, you know, it just never spoke to me. Even if it takes the same excellent glass as its brethren like the 110mm f2 or 23mm f4. For me personally, the sweet spot in all of this, with heavy emphasis on joy and what inspires me, and with specific street shooting and photojournalism use cases, is the Leica SL2. It's why we now own one. Claudia uses the CL, and even without IBIS, the Leica primes she uses with that APS-C camera are staggering. But I will say, since I was the one who took them, that the images you just saw with the 45-4P on the X1D2 are the first time I've really appreciated at a practical run-and-gun level the slightly longer focal length aesthetic of medium format, where my preferred shooting distance, my composition, and the resultant perspective came together in a way not quite like that of any other sensor format I've used. And where that 50 megapixel sensor, combined with Hassi color science, just knocked my socks off as I sought to capture the colors and textures of New York. Put differently, in hand, freed of futzing because all I'm doing is seeing, framing, and shooting, this is an awesome combination on the street. I'm only sorry I didn't have the time to do a stitched panorama for you. It was on my to-do list, because I think for those of us so inclined, this is also a fascinating, simple to operate in the field, beautiful to hold and behold, stitched pano landscape setup. Of course, as always, your mileage may vary, and that's just fine. Let's just wrap it up this way. Yum yum. This setup really does work for street photography. A joy in hand, easy to focus, magnificent color, resolution pop, and perspective at a more accessible price than ever for a Hasselblad. An interesting price compared to a Leica M. I do wish, since I now see this as a street camera, for a firmware update to add a super legible depth of field scale in the EVF and on the rear screen to make zone focusing easier, and which would leave the camera focused to that point and aperture when turned back on. I do wish Focus 2 Mobile offered panoramic stitching. I do like a flippy screen, but short of that, I wish Hassi would upgrade the iPhone version of Focus Mobile so that it would be dead simple to turn the phone into a waist-level finder. Finally, I do wish they'd offer a 45-4P, call it the 45-4PM for magic, with true hard stops, and then engraved depth of field scale on the lens itself. It may not be fly-by-wire in fact, but in practice the 45-4P sure looks like one, even if the focus ring is linear and better weighted than most. Last night, Claudia and I watched Ford vs. Ferrari. Fantastic movie from every perspective. But right now, as I close up this video, I'm thinking about Ian Fleming's Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. It's a children's story, for those of you who don't know, that the author of James Bond wrote for his son, nominally about a once great magical race car saved by a family. But I think it's really about conformity, or rather, the value of nonconformity, and a family's recognition of and love for something unique, beautiful, and heroic. Mm -hmm.